good morning, everybody. In case you haven't figured it out yet, there was a schedule change. So I'm not the person who is originally supposed to be in this room at this time, but I am the person who's in this room at this time now. So my name is Nate Shuda. I work for Pivotal, as you might tell by my choice in outfit here this morning. I am part of the advocates team. I speak on architecture, microservices, serverless, things of that nature. Uh, last year, somebody said, you're really an architect as a service because we can get everything as a service these days. And, and I think that's actually a pretty good description of, of what I do, frankly. Although I did sound out the acronym in my head after somebody called me that, and I realized it may not have been meant as a compliment necessarily, but you know, to each their own. Speaking of architecture, I did write a book. Well, I call it a book. My wife calls it a pamphlet. I think she means that lovingly. Called Thinking Architecturally last year. You can get that from us in e-form. Uh, the last time I was at the booth, there were still some paper copies laying around. I don't know if there are any more, but if you swing by our booth, if you'd like to get the very rare dead tree version, please feel free to do so. If you've been in our space long enough, you realize that the cloud has become a really popular buzzword. And like so many terms in our industry, there doesn't appear to be one coherent definition of what we mean by that. There's a lot of different options for different folks. And, and you know, I, I like to joke that if I asked 20 developers what it meant to be an architect, I'd get at least 20 different answers and the cloud fits in that exact same bucket. You know, when I talk to clients and you say cloud, some people immediately think microservices. Now there's another one we don't have a good agreement on what that means. Other people are more interested in modular monoliths and lots of folks today are very excited about containers and putting things in Docker and running that on top of Kubernetes. And of course, now we've kind of shoved a little bit of that aside and we talk about this thing called serverless. And, you know, of course, everything today has to be as a service, so functions as a service. And a lot of our organizations are thinking long and hard about polycloud, this notion of we don't just want to have one provider, we want to be able to leverage multiple providers. I actually had a graduate school class this year on the cloud, and one of the things I really tried to uh, get into the brains of my graduate students is you can't necessarily just go all in on one provider. You know, we've seen a lot of interesting movement there, and you know, there's different things that you might like on one or the other, and from at least a negotiating standpoint, it can be very useful to be able to run stuff in more than just one cloud. But that puts us into this situation where we got to make sense of all this. You know, we've got business partners and CIOs and CTOs and managers and whatnot who are trying to ask us, like, hey, what should we be doing about this? And we also have to grapple with the reality that there's actual engineering issues here that we have to overcome. And I know a lot of folks believe that if I just buy this product from this place or if I just put everything on this public cloud provider, all of my problems will go away. And that's just not how it works. And so the challenge for us, I would argue, is that we want to avoid the pitfalls that are there. We want to take advantage of this new way of compute. But we also need to be very cognizant of resume-driven design. I've seen a lot of this in my career where people are very excited about using a technology and the whole rationale for using it is the name of the technology. You know, we need to use Mongo. Why? Well, because Mongo. It's like, okay, Mongo might in fact be the right solution for the problems that you have in front of you. It also might not be. You know, and it's, it's really incumbent upon us to make sure that we know when to use which tools. You know, that's one of the messages I've been trying to get across to folks for the last couple of years. So I think it's important to start with some definitions. Like, what do we even mean by this? You know, I, I long since believed that one of the most powerful artifacts you can have on a project is a glossary. I mean, how many times have you had that debate on a team about what a term means? I had a friend of mine was telling me he was on one project where they were kind of clipping along, everything was going well, and the team was using client and customer interchangeably. And after like their fourth or fifth iteration, they were having a conversation with their product owner, and the product owner said, well, that'll work for a client, but not a customer. Cue record scratch, like, wait, what? What do you mean? And it turns out there is a subtle but vitally important difference between client and customer. And so they had to go back and do a bunch of rework because they had assumed they were interchangeable terms. So I saw this tweet, it made me laugh, you know, ask your doctor if cloud native is right for you. You know, I do feel like we get a little bit of that. You know, a lot of us are sort of almost hell bent on we have to be in the cloud, why? Because cloud, and, and it's generally the place most of us want to go, but, but that doesn't mean it's the answer to every problem we've ever had. 
At the end of the day, this is pretty straightforward. We're talking about an application that's designed to take advantage of what cloud computing gives us. A lot of the constraints that we had before are removed. So think about microservice as a perfect example of this. Even if you'd had the idea for a microservice architecture 15 years ago, if you would have gone to your infrastructure people and said, hey, listen, I'm just spitballing here, but what I'd like is about 150 instances of the app server spun up in every single region. And after your operations person's head exploded, you know, they, they would have told you to go away and don't ever come back with that crazy idea. Now, of course, in fairness, we couldn't do that 15 years ago. We can today because we have the techniques, the technologies, we have that at our disposal. And so really what we're talking about with cloud native is what do you mean by how we're building and deploying these applications? Because the cloud gives us some really interesting capabilities that we didn't have in the past. Now, chief among those is the fact that I can scale up or scale down as needed and I can do it on demand. You know, if we think back to what we had to do when we were thinking about a project, one of the most important questions that we'd have to grapple with is how much capacity do you need? And we'd always have to answer that question incredibly early in a project when we knew the least about what we were trying to do. And so it was a complete guesstimate at best. And so we would always over allocate. And I, we did this actually at my previous company. We looked across our whole server infrastructure and like, what's our actual server utilization numbers? And it was a low single digit percentage, which meant we had an awful lot of capacity that was going unused. And now from our standpoint, that was the right answer because it was really hard to allocate more when we needed it. But I'm certain that our business partners weren't real happy about the fact that they were paying for capacity that they weren't using. And so the cloud frees us up from that. We can say, no, no, we'll just use what we need. We'll charge you for what we use. That's a big difference. Theoretically, we have limitless compute, but there's a big asterisk at the end of that, isn't there? Additional fees may apply. I mean, you sure as heck can scale to infinity if you want. And then your CFO is going to stop by your cube and have a conversation with you that you may not enjoy. I said this in my previous talk, but a friend of mine at her company, somebody had done an experiment with a function and they'd forgotten to shut it down. At the end of the month, their manager had a really painful conversation with him about the $100,000 cloud bill their one function had racked up. It doesn't take long to see a pretty big bill come out the other end of these things. Now, as much as we talk about this in terms of architecture, it's not just an architectural pattern. It is this interesting combination of practices, techniques, technologies. It's taking agile development and kind of putting it into its next sort of evolution. It's bringing that sort of notion of continuous delivery all the way through. It doesn't necessarily mean that code goes from I hit a commit and it's production five minutes later, but that we have a pipeline in place to make sure our code gets to production in a repeatable fashion, and we have good trust and faith that this code's gonna do what we think it's gonna do on the other end. It means we've got an awful lot of automation in the picture. This has been one of the biggest shifts I've seen in IT in my career. A lot of the things we used to do by hand, we just can't anymore. These, at the scale we're trying to operate at, you can't do it. And frankly, we should never have tried to do it manually because human beings are pretty bad at repeating themselves. You know, this is not the first time I've given this talk. I guarantee it won't be like the other times I've given this talk because I'm not that repeatable. That's just the way it is to be a human being. That might mean containers. That might mean microservices. That might mean functions. But I think one of the pieces of this equation that we don't pay enough attention to is culture. You know, this is, I mean, I'm a technologist and, and that's where I've, I live and I wish I could solve all of your problems with technology. The longer I do this, the more I've been in this space, the more I realize that some of our biggest problems are cultural problems. And those are hard to solve. I was with one of my reps last year doing a little tour of some customers in Atlanta and after like our third or fourth stop, we were driving to the next place and I looked at him and I said, you realize that a huge part of my job is technical marriage counselor. That a lot of what I do when I come in and talk with customers is basically sit at the table and kind of figure out, ah, these two people don't talk to one another. That's our problem. You two need to talk and work it out. Hug it out, kumbaya, whatever. Sometimes it's two of you need to go in a room and only one comes out, but there needs to be resolution here. You know, and, and that's one of the things I love about my job is the fact that I can come into an organization and I don't have all the baggage 
I don't, I can ask impertinent questions like, why do you do it this way? And it's amazing how often the answer to that is because we've always done it that way. I, I was working with one customer and their, their issue was the fact that they could no longer finish like their, their batch run overnight anymore. It was taking too long. And so they're walking me through the architecture and, and they're like, yeah, we process each of these widgets sequentially. And then and I'm like, well, hang on. Do you have to process them sequentially? Like, does the result of widget A feed into widget B? No, no, not at all. So you could do them in parallel? They're like, oh, we never thought of that. Now, I don't think that I'm particularly brilliant for having seen that. It's just I didn't have the expectation of, well, that's how we've always done it. And we, we get that way. We can get myopic. We're like, but we have to solve it this way because this is how we've always solved it. And that's one of the advantages of bringing in a fresh set of eyes is to say, hey, wait, did you look at the problem this way? Now, culture is hard to change. Culture is one of those things that gets set very early on in a company's, company's existence. You hire, attract, retain based around culture. I mean, let's be brutally honest. When we talk about interviews, what we're really looking for is, are you a good cultural fit? I can teach you the skills you need. That part's pretty easy. Do you fit with us? Do we fit with you? Is a much harder thing to figure out sometimes. It's going to mean some DevOps in some way, shape, or form. And maybe that's using kind of the new SRE phrasing. Maybe that's just bringing that to the forefront. You know, I, I saw that shift in my previous company from, you know, them being completely separate organization to having a DevOps team and, and having them be, you know, partners with us as we try to build applications. And it, what's been really interesting to me, and I talked a lot about this in the previous session, is just to see this shift in infrastructure. You know, I mean, I remember when I first started in IT, we handcrafted our servers. I mean, we literally like ordered the parts, you know, we're soldering things together, pushing, you know, chips down on motherboards. And it was a very bespoke artisanal approach, which is great for, you know, your lunch or for a coffee or something like that. I don't want that in infrastructure though. And what was interesting is the more time you put into something, the more invested you are in it and the more resistant you are to change. And so when you spend days handcrafting servers, you begin to consider them members of the family. You start treating them like pets. For example, these are my pets. This is Han and Chewie. These are my cats. I am convinced that were Han or Chewie to develop so much as a sniffle, my son and my wife would implore me to spend virtually unlimited amounts of money making them happy and healthy because they're members of the family. And they kind of run the house. I mean, I, I, I think I told this story earlier today, but if, if I could be any other kind of animal, like if I, couldn't be, if I had to not be a human and could choose what animal, I'd want to be a house cat. I mean, this is a good gig. A lot of sleeping. You know, we were joking, like, you know, our watches today will we'll give you, like, your rings. you got to fill your rings, you know, get your steps in. And, and I, we were joking one day that, you know, the cats have that same thing, except it's not about, like, movement. It's about, like, sleeping. And, and like eating, you know, their rings are very different than ours. Now, the moral of the story is those servers that we created 15, 20 years ago, we would do whatever it took to keep them happy and healthy. And because these were so expensive, they were this, this really heavily constrained resource. We had to get our money's worth out of it to make the CIO happy. And in order to do that, we created this thing called an app server where we were incented to put as many apps as possible on top of that one piece of hardware because that maximizes our return on investment. Now, anyone who has built software in this era knows that there are some really unfortunate unintended side effects here, because once we have shared resources, if your application has a bug, you can take my application down. All of a sudden, coordinating changes becomes much, much harder. If you've ever been in your organization, you're like, I'd really like to move to the next version of Java, and you were told, no, I'm sorry, you can't, because we have to wait until our oldest app is ready, that slows everybody down. That's no fun. And this is why currency has typically been this thing that we don't really want to talk about. Just keep kicking the proverbial can down the street. Hopefully someone else will be responsible for solving it in the future, but not us. And this is fundamentally why so many of our organizations completely ignored currency because it was a really hard problem to solve. Yeah, I, I remember going through this. You guys remember when we finally killed Windows XP? That was a good day. It really was. I mean, I, 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 I lasted on that much longer than I ever intended to. And I remember finally being at my company and we were finally moving off of it. And 
I was blown away by how many of the application areas were fighting tooth and nail to retain things from the old version. I had one application get very upset with me because Microsoft, now Microsoft, not us, Microsoft had changed one of their fonts. And so these guys were using that as the reason why they couldn't accept the new image. And I'm just like, you've got to be kidding me, right? Now, that made me think about Star Wars. A lot of things make me think about Star Wars. I'm a Star Wars fan. I'm excited to see the end of the trilogy coming up here this December. But I love this Yoda quote. Fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. And I thought, you know, this is what enterprise IT has been for a lot of us. I mean, this is Yoda ops. And I think about what we've traditionally done during this era of compute. And what do we have to do? We would move our code, our application code, from one instance of one app server to another instance of another app server running somewhere else, and we would just expect it all to work. Why? My favorite, of course, is throughout this period, at least certainly from my experience, I wrote code on one operating system and deployed it to a very different operating system. And then again, we were shocked when something didn't work. My friend actually had a sticker made up that said, works on my box. And if you uttered that in a meeting, he would slap one of those on your laptop. And he did not mean it as a badge of honor. This was something to shame people. But every one of us has had the experience of, well, it worked in dev, but not in test. Or it worked in test, but not in mate. Or it worked in mate, but not in prod. And you would inevitably start pounding your head against the table trying to figure out why. Because your operations people insisted the environments are identical. Except clearly they're not. There's something different. What's different? And you would spend days, weeks, trying to track down what was the little bit of thing that wasn't quite the same. This happened to me on one project. We wasted two weeks tracking down the difference. And it turns out the difference was the order the patches were applied in. Right? I mean, how do you, how do you see that? This is literally where you start to think there has to be a better way to make a living. You know, poor set of life choices have brought me here. You know, maybe I should get into like, you know, electrician or plumbing or something like that. There has to be a better way to make a living than this. Now, we've seen a big shift recently, though. We finally figured out that servers are commodities. And instead of buying this proprietary hardware with proprietary operating systems, we're going to use this off-the-shelf stuff. We're going to use Linux. We're going to use Intel, which, of course, leads to this. This is one of my, my favorite cartoons. Dad, what are clouds made of? Linux servers, mostly. It's the truth. You can always tell what profession someone's in by how they answer a question like that. Now, unsurprisingly, prices started to drop when we did this. And we figured out pretty quickly that servers are not, in fact, the constraining factor in this world. It's actually people costs and people time. And a whole new version of compute started popping up with Heroku and AWS and App Engine and Cloud Foundry and Azure. And we realized pretty quickly that these shared servers are actually a liability. And that instead of treating them as family pets, we need to treat them like cows. And if you've ever been on a large cattle operation, you realize they do not name the cows, they give them numbers. That's not entirely true. I actually grew up on a hobby farm. And so we had, I don't know, maybe 20 or so Texas Longhorn cows, so the ones with big, big racks. And we did name them, uh, you know, although sometimes we named them as a reminder of what was going to happen in the fall, just to make sure that we are all on the same page. I mean, the cow didn't know the difference, but we did. We actually had one cow. We named her Houdini because she somehow knew how to get in and out of the pen at will. She never went anywhere because she knew where mom was and she knew where food was and she wasn't stupid, but she liked to roam around. And so one day I remember sitting in, in my house and, and I kind of felt like there was like a presence behind me and I look over my shoulder and sure enough, here's this calf on our back porch just staring at me, wagging her tail like, hey, can I come inside? You know, she was basically like, as she grew up, just this like 800 pound dog. She was kind of cute. But that's kind of the, the uh, exception to the rule, to say the least. Nowadays, we have some new abstractions. We have containers, we have platforms, and this has changed the game for us because now instead of taking code and moving it from one instance to another, we can just take everything together and move that. And actually, in most cases, we're not actually moving it. We're just changing a routing table. And so, of course, it's going to work because we haven't changed anything. And so we've removed variables. So if it works in dev, of course it's going to work in test. If it works in test, of course it's going to work in mate. Because it's the same thing. 
And so a whole class of problems just disappears, which is good. We want to eliminate variables. Now, the other aspect of this that's so very, very powerful for us is now, oh, you'd like to be on a different version of Java? That's fantastic. Go ahead. Oh, you need a different version of this library than I do? That's great. Go ahead. We are no longer constrained by our slowest moving heritage application. Because we don't share anymore, you aren't impacted by decisions I make. We have fundamentally moved the value line here. Our goal in modern computing should be to get out of undifferentiated heavy lifting. And really the mantra that we want to have is this, this CF haiku, which says, here is my source code, run it on the cloud for me. I do not care how. Because at the end of the day, I'm just trying to solve business problems. My customer needs something to happen. The underlying infrastructure shouldn't matter. Now, this has changed our development because it's freed us up to implement the always be changing mindset. Because this has traditionally been the trench warfare of software. As developers, we want to constantly be changing environments. Our operations people never want to change anything ever because it's working, don't touch it, don't breathe on it. And I completely understand why, because our operations people are fundamentally incented by uptime. I remember having this conversation with the woman that ran DevOps at my previous company, and she told me how she dreaded Monday mornings because she knew on Monday morning the CIO was gonna drag her into his office and he was gonna chew on her for an hour because big important application says they can't test because you aren't giving them stable regions to test in. Now, that wasn't actually the case. They were using her as a scapegoat. They were blaming her for their own internal problems. But she learned the lesson, which was, we're going to pour concrete over the infrastructure and nothing's going to change ever. And now you can't blame me. So that doesn't actually help us either because we want to be changing. We want to be doing A-B testing. We want to try experiments. We need to be responsive to the changes in the business world. You know, I mean, I remember when I first started in software, it was acceptable, maybe not a great thing, but it was acceptable to be able to tell our customers, you can have that in 18 months. We can't do that anymore. Things are moving much too quickly. We need to deliver in days, not months. At Spring One a couple of years ago, the gentleman from Scotiabank got up and he talked about how they went from doing like, you know, the typical four deploys a year to 3,000 deploys a month. And a bunch of my, my friends from my previous company were there and they were talking about this. And I said, yeah, you guys, this is really great. This is what we're trying to do. And they're like, well, Nate, you know, you worked in our environment. You know, we can't do that. And I just shook my head and said, guys, if a bank can do it, you can do it. Because the moral of the story today is all of our industries are being disrupted in some way, shape or form. And what we're learning now is speed matters so very much. Because every industry is being impacted. There isn't an industry today that's immune to this. You know, for a long time, grocery stores could claim, oh, we don't need to worry about this. And then Amazon goes and buys Whole Foods. And you're like, uh-oh, Amazon's in the grocery business. And if you've watched Amazon over the last 20 years, they're typically, you know, they're playing to win. I've seen insurance companies say rightly that, hey, Google's actually one of our biggest competitors. If you take a step back, what is an insurance company but a collection of information? It's a model of risk. You know who's pretty good at dealing with lots and lots of information and categorizing it? Google. Now, I know this is an inconvenient fact for a lot of people, but we are all technology companies today. I remember being with one client last year, I guess it was two years ago now, and their CIO got up and said, listen, we aren't a grocery store chain. We are a technology company that happens to be in the retail sector. And I thought that's a remarkable switch because I mean, I remember in the beginning of my career, you know, even 10 years ago to see someone at that level claim they were a technology company was heresy. Oh, you can't say that. First and foremost, we're this and technology is just a cost center. It's not anymore. Now I can't say 12 or I can't say cloud native without mentioning the 12 factors. And that's the 12 factor app from the Heroku guys. And that's basically a characteristic or characteristics of apps that were successful, at least on Heroku. Now 
I would argue these are just good design decisions, period. But a lot of people frame it as cloud native. One code base in version control, multiple deploys. I don't think version control is controversial anymore, right? Everybody uses version control. You're using Git. You might be using Git, or you could use Git. Right? We're all on the same page there. I remember, this is, this is a long time ago, admittedly, but I was working with a, a team at my company, and I, I asked one of their, their lead developers, I'm like, hey, can you send me the URL for your repo? And he's like, the what now? I said, you know, the URL for your repo, you know, your subversion repo, just send me the URL, go look at your code. He's like, oh, we're not, we're not in subversion. I said, oh, are you guys, you guys still on clear case? No, no, we're not in clear case. I'm like, well, what are you on? He's like, oh, we just keep the code out on the LAN. Periodically, we go ahead and copy the folder over and give it a new name, and then we email each other files. And I sort of back slowly away. I'm like, I can't help you. I'm sorry. You're on your own. We need to explicitly define our dependencies. This one can be really hard because we haven't traditionally had to do that. If you've ever looked in the bin folder in a project, you see a bazillion things. Frankly, if you've ever done like an NPM install, You've downloaded like a third of the internet, and you're like, why do we need this? I don't know, but it works, so don't ask any silly questions. I'm convinced NPM exists as a distributed backup of the internet. Right? We can recreate the internet just with the people in this room right now because we've done enough NPM installs. We need to separate our configuration from the code. Our, our backing services have to be treated like an attached resource. We want to have this build, release, run pipeline concept. We need to be stateless. This is a hard one. I've been guilty of stashing an awful lot of stuff in session over the years because it was so darn easy. And even when we first started doing this on like the very first web app I ever ran into, it works great right up until you have to start load balancing. And then you start becoming familiar with terms like sticky affinity and things like that. And you're like, how do we get state copied across? And then you're like, oh man, putting stuff in session was a really bad idea, but it's too late because we put everything in session. Yeah, that's a problem in the cloud because I'm going to blow this instance away and recreate it. And so all of that's gone. So you can't rely on sort of that debris being left behind. We're going to export services via port binding. We're going to scale via process. Another way of just saying we're going to scale horizontally as opposed to throwing bigger hardware at it. We need to start up fast. This is hard. I've built a lot of apps where like, the first thing we did on startup was go call the database like 10,000 times and load a whole bunch of stuff into memory because we didn't understand caching. And so we used that as a way of trying to speed things up. And that's fine if I'm only rebooting that system like nightly or something. But in a world where, again, I'm destroying and recreating instances perhaps constantly, this becomes an issue. We've always wanted this. This is not a cloud native thing at all. There has been no point in my development history where I've said, I really hope dev doesn't look like prod. Logs as event streams can take a little bit of time for people to get used to, but the general idea here is I can't just go to the file system and work my way through a log file because the file system might be gone the next time I come back. So I have to stream these logs somewhere else and then use a different set of tools to get at it. This is actually a pretty easy thing to change. The hard part for most of us is getting used to the new ways of ingesting the logs. Although typically our tooling now is so much better than what we had to do, like you know, command effing our way through a file or grepping a file. This is actually a huge, huge win. And then we want to do our admin tasky things as a one-off process in the same environment. I hate to say it, but if you've got an application that you wrote 15 years ago, you're going to violate some of these 12 factors. And there is a chance you violated all of them. It's unlikely, but it's possible. Now, on the off chance that you managed to create an application that didn't violate any of these, you, you wrote a cloud-native application before there was such a thing as cloud-native, I want to have a chat with you, but not about technology. I'd like to talk about your thoughts on the stock market. Where should I be investing my money? What companies are going to be worth more in a year? And I'm pretty sure you've got some thoughts on some sporting events as well. I'd like to help you, have you help me place some bets. I think that'd be useful. Better way to monetize your gift. In general, the things that I've seen time and time again, the explicitly defining your dependencies is hard. This is a bit of a challenge. Because in so many of our applications, you throw a library in there and you're like, it works, don't touch it, don't breathe on it. And I get that. I understand that. But we need to think long and hard. Is this really something we need? I've seen applications that were written expecting other apps to be installed in the same context. That doesn't work here, obviously. So if you need that library, if you need that DLL, you need to explicitly define it. 
Separating out configuration can be difficult as well. It's very easy to have a hard-coded credential. It's very easy to have a hard-coded database connection. So the typical mantra here is pretend you're going to open source your application tomorrow, and what would you need to pull out of the app to make sure you could do that safely? We don't want to share anything. Again, this can be a bit of a challenge. I've seen, I've written applications that were designed around a specific page flow. You go here and then you go there and you go somewhere else and you're leaving little breadcrumbs behind for the next pages. Again, we've all had that mantra, just put it in session and that fails in this environment because again, session won't be there when we come back. It has to be in something durable. We need to start up fast. We need to shut down fast. Again, I've been guilty of building applications that take minutes to start up. That doesn't work in this environment because whatever you're using to orchestrate these, these applications, if you say, I need five instances of this running at all times, and your orchestrator notices there's only four, it's going to spin up another one. And part of that is a health check to say, are you ready to receive traffic? And so it's going to ask the new instance, are you healthy? Are you running? Oh, you're not? Okay. All right, how about now? Oh, you're not? Oh, you must not be healthy. Let me spin up another one. And that cycle continues until you've exhausted all of your resources and your CFO comes and has a chat with you about your cloud bill. We obviously have always wanted dev prod parity. We need consistency between these regions because it's all about shortening code to prod. That's actually a really good mental exercise. How long would it take for you to get a code change from my customer wants this to it's running in production? Is that measured in days, weeks, months? And to make it really interesting, do the simplest change possible. Do like a CSS change. My customer wants a slightly different shade of purple. How long does that take to roll through? <clears throat> We've all uttered this phrase at one point or another again. We need consistency across our regions. Now, I've had some people tell me that in order to go to the cloud, I need to be fully 12-factor compliant. That is not, in fact, the case. If you can get there, great. Go forth and do it. But I'm sorry, we live in the real world, and you need to be ruthlessly pragmatic. Now, understand that certain things, if you don't actually work, they're going to lessen the advantages you get out of being in the cloud. If you have long startup time, it's really hard to do self-healing. It's really hard to scale. I like to think of this fundamentally as a continuum. You know, so if we sort of have that basic idea of, you know, I've got my sort of 12-factor compliance, the further I get down that path, the better. My application has, you know, got some better factors, but I don't have to go all the way there. Now, you'll hear some people talk about 15 factors. You'll hear some people talk about beyond the 12 factors. However you define it, the moral of the story is if you want to maximize what the cloud gives us, the applications have to be designed to take advantage of that. Again, heritage applications, legacy applications will fall short. That's okay. You know, I, I, we always have this very negative view of an application that's been around for like 5, 10, 15 years. I try to get people to flip that a bit and think like, pat yourself on the back for the fact that your team created an application that has been providing business value for years, decades in some cases. That's, that's a good accomplishment. You shouldn't feel bad about that. You know, now obviously it's challenging because we have a lot of requirements that are buried in the code because there's all those weird one-off cases that nobody thought about until they actually happen. You know, this is one of the things about human beings. We're not great at sort of thinking about weird edge cases. Usually we can fix them when they run, we run into them, but beyond that, it's hard. I remember once, this was years ago, I worked on this application and we built it for some folks in our company and then handed it over to them. And then I hadn't worked on it in probably almost two years. And I come in one morning and my, my director comes over and says, hey, you know that app you wrote? I need you to go take a look at it. They say their build broke this morning and they're not sure why. And so my initial software engineering, you know, glib response was, well, they obviously made a coding change that broke the build. They just need to figure it out. And they're like, no, no, they haven't changed the code in weeks. And I'm like, well, builds don't break if there hasn't been changes. All right, cool. I'll go dig into it. And I figured out it was a test that had failed. And it was a test that I'd written. And so I looked at the test and I'd figured out after a few minutes of investigating that, ah, this was one of those wonderful instances where like every seven years that test was going to fail. And you know, there was some weird calendar thing that, you know, it tipped over and, and that just happened to be that morning that it failed. And I'm like, okay, 
So everybody knows this won't fail again for seven years. So I can either fix it uh, or we can just like pretend it's all good and just know that in seven years it's going to break again. I can't honestly can't remember what we did, but that was a fascinating reminder that, that sometimes things break even when we, uh, we don't intend them to. So we need to be very pragmatic, very ruthless in our refactoring. If you're building Greenfield today, please go cloud native. I can't fathom why you'd want to build legacy code today, but your mileage may vary. Now, I can't say cloud native without mentioning microservices. It's right there in the contract. Now, microservices are this really interesting reaction to sort of heavyweight monolithic services, as well as the fact that the cloud frees us up from a lot of the constraints that we've had before. And I've worked on plenty of monoliths. They're not a lot of fun. Your developer productivity is pretty low. It's really difficult to get your head wrapped around a multi-thousand line code base. You know, I, was, I worked on one application that was like two million lines of Java or some crazy thing. I mean, it took forever to be productive in that environment. I mean, on that code base, at the time at least, you couldn't actually be current on the entire code base. That was impossible. You know, you could be current on your part of the code base, but it took you anywhere from three days to two weeks to actually get a new build running. And so once you did, you basically didn't touch the parts you weren't messing with. You only worried about your aspect of it, which meant there were a lot of build breaks because there was lots of unintended side effects of changes. Now, the challenge of that is when you've got these big ramps for new developers, it's hard to get productive. You know, on that application, the sort of conventional wisdom was it took you a year to be productive in that environment. You, know, you think about a lot of companies that, that you've probably worked at or applications you've worked on, there's like an 80-page getting started guide and several steps in it are then go talk to Kathy and like then go talk to Steve. In fact, I was embedded in somebody's getting started guide for like three years. I'd, I'd been on the application early and then rolled off. And so for like three years, I kept getting phone calls at random intervals saying, hi, I'm at the part of the app setup where it says I call you. And I'm like, great. And of course, I didn't have rights to change it. They, they pulled that, but, you know, so I, I finally got out of their, their startup guide when one of my friends was on the project, and he called me, and he's like, dude, why am I calling you? You haven't worked on this in three years. I'm like, I know, but I can't change their guide anymore. I don't have rights to it. And he says, I'll update it. I'm like, thank you. So then I finally got removed. Now, of course, if you've been on these applications, you know that one small change means I have to rebuild everything. That's not a lot of fun. I remember working on one application where my tester said, if you want me to do a full regression test, that's 80 hours. I'm like, oh, okay, well, that could be a problem. And so it forced us to work in bigger steps than we'd like to, honestly. Small, or scaling meant I had to scale the entire thing. That was not a lot of fun. You know, in a perfect world, we would just scale the part of the app that needed it. We couldn't do that in these monoliths. They're really difficult to evolve. At some point in your schooling, you learned about the second law of thermodynamics, otherwise known as a teenager's bedroom. The universe wants to be disordered. You do your best to keep it clean, it's not going to last. I mean, I try. I try to keep my desk at home clean, but here's what happens. I'm going to come home from this trip. I'm basically going to dump out my backpack, a whole bunch of receipts are going to go all over my desk. I'm going to get a nasty gram from my expense system that says, go do your expenses. I'll do my expenses and, and put everything away, and it'll be clean until I get home from the next trip. Nature of the beast. Software is not immune from this. Every one of you has been on a new project, and you've uttered some variant of this time, we're going to do it right. We're going to keep the packages clean. We're not going to cross the streams. And then six months later, you're like, why did we do this? Why have we devolved to this? Because modularity breaks down. It takes longer and longer to add new features. And so this fundamentally gave birth to this new architectural style, a.k.a. the microservice. Now, there is no one definition. This is very much, you'll know it when you see it which leads to one of my all-time favorite tweets is actually from my boss who wants to argue about the definitions of made-up words with me. We do a lot of that in this industry. We make up a new word and then we argue about what that word means. Now, I'm kind of partial to the anything that can be rewritten in two weeks or less because that reminds us these things are supposed to be small. I've had some people argue it's anything that can be written by a two-pizza team. I don't find that a particularly satisfying definition, though. Because first and foremost, you know, we're, we're coming into the lunch hour here. We're probably a little hungrier than we would be after lunch. So two pizzas might not go as far now as they would in a couple hours. The other side effect, of course, is how big are these pizzas? All right, this is actually one that my dad made. This is essentially a single-serving pizza. So I don't want a team of two. That's not quite right. 
But the biggest problem I have with the two pizza team definition is it doesn't help me with a really important question that one of my directors asked me when we started going to cloud native. He said, Nate, how many services can my two pizza team handle? And so I had to tell him the, you know, consultant answer, which is it depends. Because if, if we've got services that are really volatile and they're changing all the time, my two pizza team might be able to handle four or five of them. Maybe that might even be too much. If my services are pretty stable and they're not changing a lot, that exact same two pizza team might be able to handle 20 of them. So it's very different. I think it's more important to think in terms of characteristics, small focus services, do one thing, do it well. It's basically that Linux concept, that Unix concept of have a tool that does one thing, pipe them together to get more complicated results out the other end. Things that can be independently deployed, independently scaled, things that can evolve at different rates. If you need the freedom to choose a different technology stack, these things are all meant to be built around a business capability or fundamentally it's high cohesion, low coupling. This is the zeroth law of software engineering right here. Almost everything boils down to that. If you flip through the gang of four patterns book, a shocking number of those patterns is this at a different level of abstraction. So the way I look at it is microservices is high cohesion, low coupling applied to services. It's just an approach. It's just a pattern. It is not in fact the hammer that solves all problems. And wait, is it, is it too late? Is it too early for spoilers? Has everybody seen Endgame? It turns out people, there are more than one worthy person to pick up Mjolnir. The other way I like to always think about folks or talk about folks when it comes to this is they're just tools. It's just another tool in our toolbox. Just like serverless, just like containers, just like Kubernetes, just like all this stuff, they're just tools. And the challenge for us as technologists is knowing when to use which tool and knowing how to use them wisely. Which is why I wrote this series last year called Please Microservice Responsibly. It's, it's the set of factors that we use to help customers understand, should I even make this microservices? I think the first article was titled like, should that be a microservice? Because so many people get caught up in, you know, we're doing microservices, like why? Like, it, does that make sense? Does that actually fit? If it does, great. If it doesn't, that's a problem. Now, my friend Simon has this great way of phrasing it. He's like, you know, if you can't build a monolith, what makes you think a microservice is going to be better? You know, he likes to say you must be this tall to ride. You know, and I think his other way of phrasing it is if you can't handle a big ball of mud, what makes you think a distributed big ball of mud is going to be better? Right? And I hate to say it, but sometimes the right answer is a modular monolith. We don't have to make everything a microservice just because microservices are a popular architectural pattern. I have started to hear people talk about microservices being legacy, which is crazy. It hasn't been around that long. Now that of course moves us towards serverless, which is kind of this evolution from IaaS to CAS to PaaS. And now we're talking about serverless. I had somebody say to me last year, they're going to refactor their entire application as a series of functions. I do bite my tongue to keep from like audibly guffawing at that. Cause that seemed like such an incredibly stupid thing to say. So that's kind of the new thing. And of course, everything's as a service. And so a lot of people are very excited about that. And you know, that might give you some pause because hang on, I just refactored to cloud native microservices. I don't want to do that. You know, this, this seems like a bad thing and maybe you're old school and, and you do the table flip. I actually have this as a keyboard expansion on my phone, by the way, my wife saw this slide and she looked at it and she's like, what is that? I said, it's table flip. She said, what? I said, table flip. See, feet are up in the air, arms up in the air, table flip. She shook her head, walked out of the room and said, you have a really weird job. I said, I do. That's true. So please don't throw away your code quite yet. It's fair to say FAS is a subset of serverless. A lot of people do use the terms interchangeably. Fair warning, there are still servers. Sorry. This is like the worst name we've ever come up with except for all the other ones. The advantage, of course, is you are further abstracted away from it. You're not responsible for provisioning, updating, scaling. And of course, my friend Paul then took that as an opportunity to say, hey, how come we didn't call it DevOpsless? Because that really does not roll off the tongue nicely. But if you've ever tried to pronounce Paul's last name, you'd understand. Because it's, it's Sharkovsky. It's very difficult. So actually, he's got a really... His name breaks most travel systems because it's like 21 characters. And apparently, most travel systems cut off at 20 which is fascinating to me to see like, it's interesting as a software engineer to see how various technical decisions leak through and you're like, oh, I know what kind of database you're using under the covers, isn't that funny? <clears throat> so we don't have to worry about it, somebody else does, which of course it's fair to say, but 
we have to patch all of these things, right? I mean, this is something Sam brought up last year, and, and he's not wrong. You know, there's a lot more layers to this than there used to be. But that prompted a reply from Josh who said, well, you're right, but that's why we have all these platforms. That's why we have public cloud providers. That's why we have Cloud Foundry to help solve these problems so you can focus on business problems and not underlying dial tone issues. Let someone else solve that for you. And so the way to think about this is these are just layers. So we've got IaaS, that's still part of the equation. I can choose to use containers, in which case I'm bringing the container to the party. I'm responsible for the care and maintenance of that container. And that environment gives me scheduling and networking and metrics and logging. I can use a platform, in which case the container's provided for me and I just have to write the application. And then that platform gives me images, networking, monitoring, quota, team usage, things like that. I can go to serverless, and now again, I don't have to worry about the container, I just have to write a function, 10, 15, 20 lines of code. I don't have to worry about how it gets executed, how it gets scaled, how I bind to that event stream. The big difference between these layers fundamentally is what am I responsible for as a developer? And what is provided for me by the underlying platform? That's really what we're talking about here. The challenge for us as engineers, as architects, is figuring out when do we use each of these platforms? They all have value. Each of these abstractions will solve a different set of problems for you. You cannot, in fact, fit every problem into one of these buckets. You can try, and it's not going to work real well. They're just different levels of abstraction. Or another way of thinking about it is layer cake. So we've got hardware at the bottom. There's still hardware. Whether or not you own it is another question. IaaS provisions that hardware. You can use containers on top of that. You can use a platform on top of that. Or you can use serverless on top of that. Now, the further down the hierarchy we go, the more flexibility I have. If I'm installing my own hardware, I get exactly what I want. But I'm also responsible for the care and feeding of that hardware. The further up the abstraction hierarchy I go, I'm more constrained. If I'm writing a function, it can't be infinity in size. It can't run forever. You know, if I'm on one of the public providers, I think the max execution is generally measured in, I think it's 15 minutes might be the longest. And I don't get unlimited memory, unlimited size. I'm constrained. But I got a lot less to worry about. I just write some code. And I don't have to worry about a whole bunch of other problems. The general advice that we try to give people is push as many workloads as far up the stack as you can realizing that not everything fits in each bucket. Now, there's a lot of options here. There's obviously Lambda. That's probably the oldest of the functions environment. There's Azure functions. There's Google Cloud functions. There's a bunch of open source options like Riff, Kubeless, Knative, et cetera. This very much suffers from the shiny new thing curse. I've seen this throughout my career. Developers are like dogs chasing a squirrel. You know, it's like, ooh, new technology. Oh, Mongo. Oh, Kubernetes. Oh, blockchain. You know, we just run after it. I don't know what's cause and effect. I'm, I'm not sure if we get into this industry because we have short attention spans or being in this industry gives you a short attention span, but that does seem to come with the job. So we have to be very careful with that. We also have to be hyper aware of the lemming effect. I've seen a lot of people get very excited about a technology because they read a white paper or they saw a presentation or whatever it happens to be. And it's like, you know, that may or may not fit for you. You have to understand the constraints that you're living under. But there are some very good reasons to use this approach. It's not just a new magic way to cloud. There's some pretty good efficiency gains. From a development perspective, we're up that abstraction curve so I can focus more on just solving that business problem and less on the underlying dial tone. You know, I always like to kind of quiz developers, like, you know, do you know what operating system you're running on? More importantly, do you care? You know, we need to think about the stuff that we should care about. And for most of us, that's solving business problems, not worrying about the dial tone. And so again, that gets us into thinking about the value line and is, it's in our best interest to do as little undifferentiated heavy lifting as possible. You know, this is one of my all-time favorite slides. This is my boss, Andrew Clay Schaefer. Good job configuring servers this year, said no CEO ever. Your customers don't bake you a cake because you upgraded your application servers from one version of Linux to another. Sorry. It's important work, don't get me wrong. We have to pay attention to currency. But our customers care about solving business problems. They want features, functionality, bug fixes. And so that really should be our focus. We obviously get some pretty extreme resource efficiencies because if my function has not been called, we can terminate the container. And when a request comes in, a container springs into existence to answer that call. And of course, a lot of people get very excited because look, there's so many that are free and they don't notice the asterisks. There is always an asterisk. 
Because yes, additional fees may apply, like data transfer fees or other services that you might leverage on your provider. So no, they're not free, I'm sorry. Even though it is this weird fraction of a penny per caught per invocation, big numbers times little numbers result in big numbers. And so yes, you are charged based on how many requests, how long it took to rant, run those requests, and how many resources were allocated to solve that request, which means it can be really, really hard to figure out how much it's gonna cost. In fact, in a lot of cases, you're better off allocating more resources, even though that's more expensive, because it runs faster. Right, so this is not an easy thing to figure out in some cases. But for certain workloads, this is as good as it gets. Now there's some really serious operational efficiencies. Again, this is kind of the serverless ops. It's not that there aren't servers, it's just that we're not responsible for them. So it's in our best interest to rely on a platform to solve these problems for us, but it's a very useful tool to have in the toolkit. It should go without saying that it is not, in fact, a fit for every workload. Dave Sire did a presentation last year, and I kind of paraphrased this out of what he had to say, that it isn't the right answer for every problem. If you've got a situation that's latency sensitive, you shouldn't be using functions. You know, a lot of people love to rag on Java in particular and say, oh, Java's too slow for functions. That's the wrong way of thinking about it. Java is actually incredibly fast. And if you don't believe me, go Google some of the stuff that Dave's been talking about for the last year plus about how ridiculously fast it can be. Right? The challenge is if the latency aspect of this is going to show up and affect your customer, this is the wrong abstraction. If I'm processing 3 million batch records and the first record takes 3 seconds and every subsequent record takes 300 milliseconds, who cares? If I'm using functions in such a space that my end user is going to run smack dab into that, every so often one of my poor customers is going to sit around and wait for all my containers to warm up, I've chosen the wrong solution not serverless bad or Java bad, I made a bad choice. So hopefully that's fairly obvious. Now this made me cry. I saw this in the fall. Someone apparently at a conference such as this, I don't know which conference it was, said it's a best practice to have a function, poke your function so it never goes out of state. It never gets terminated. I'm glad I wasn't in the audience because I think I would have taken exception to that request. This is most definitely not a best practice. If someone suggests this to you, you should probably you know, figure out why, maybe back out of the room. So how do we get to this cloud native nirvana that everybody talks about? Well, I've done this in my previous company. And of course, step one is where are you today? So you're gonna have to assess your portfolio you're going to have to look across your applications and get a sense of where you're at. Now, without exception, some of your applications are going to be great candidates, others are going to be terrible candidates, and so we need to know some things about these apps. There are certain technical characteristics that we need to understand. What would you say the tech stacks are? Most importantly, what version of those tech stacks are we using? How many customers do we have on this? What kind of transaction volume are we looking at? What components do we use? What third-party things do we use? How do we integrate at the data layer? What are we using to get at the data? What are internal frameworks? Because there are almost always internal frameworks. This blows me away how many of us have built our own internal frameworks. I really shouldn't even admit this in public, but many, many years ago, before JSPs existed, well, I shouldn't say it, before JSPs were a 1.0 technology, we essentially created our own JSP-like thing. And we eventually got rid of it because we knew it was a pain, but, but that was our whole thing is, hey, we'd really like to write some HTML and just have some of this stuff dynamically injected into it, creating our own internal version of JSP. That was a great idea. There's probably some batch jobs. How does code get to production today? Do we have any pipelines? Do we like them? Do they work? How's our test coverage? Actually, we need to know a little more than test coverage. A friend of mine is telling me this story he rolls on this project, and he's brought in because they're having lots of regressions. Every time there's a release, there's regressions. And he says, okay, all right, let's, let's get into it. And, and so the first things he notices, is, hey, they've got really good test coverage. He's like, man, your test coverage is like you know, almost 90%. They're like, yeah, we're really proud of that. And so he starts looking through the test, and he notices a pattern. And he thinks it's isolated, but, but as he goes through more and more of their tests, he discovers that there's a problem. And so he goes to the tech lead, and he says, listen, I was looking through your tests, and I couldn't help but notice you don't have any asserts. And tech lead says, well, yeah, but our, our code coverage is, is like almost 
Okay, I think I know what your regression problem is. We need to understand the refactoring effort, and so there's certain red flags we want to be on the lookout for. Do we have any vendor dependencies? Are we writing to the file system? Are we reading from the file system? Do we have long startup times, long shutdown times? Is there any place we're using non-HTTP protocols? Do we have some hard-coded configuration in there somewhere? We use a container-based shared state. Did we try to do distributed transactions? Because that's not going to work anymore. Not that it ever really did that well. We also want to look at our adherence to the 12 factors and understand that it's a sliding scale. So all we're looking for here is how far out of alignment are we for this particular app? And no, I can't evaluate your app for you. I need people who have subject matter expertise. And yes, it will take some time. In my experience, having done this on about a 400 app portfolio, it's about a three to four hours per application. I strongly advise you to build a little tool to store all this data in. Excel is not an application platform. Please do not put this in Excel because here's what's going to happen. A senior director is going to ask you for a question that could be answered with a SQL statement and it's unanswerable in Excel without a significant amount of pain. Now, luckily for me, one of my friends is an Excel wizard and so he built a bunch of macros for me. Otherwise, I would probably literally still be trying to comb through this data to answer basic questions like, how many applications violate this factor? Now, if you've only got 10 applications, it's fine, but if you've got anything on a normal enterprise, this is not gonna work. You're gonna end up with a bucket here of, of applications, you know, low, medium, high, red, yellow, green, whatever you wanna call it, whatever works for you. The cutoffs here are gonna be pretty arbitrary, that's okay. You're gonna to wanna to do a bit of a sanity check. Does this feel about right? Really important that you consider business value of the application. This will help you pick good candidates. You also need to understand the life cycle of the application. Or in other words, is this strategic? Is this something we're going to invest in or is it going to be retired at the end of the year? Understand that retirement is an interesting question. If someone says, don't worry about this app, we're gonna retire it, your very next question needs to be, when? So I was working with some of our architects on this and someone said, hey, yeah, I have an app like that. I was told when I started here, this app was marked sunset. I'm still working on that application today. I said, how long ago did you start? 25 years ago. This happens all the time. So if it's going away in three months or six months, fine. It's probably not worth the effort. If it's gonna be around for the next five years, it is. Now we need to do some planning. What's our desired end state? Are we trying to get to cloud native? That's a lot more work. Are we just trying to forklift it into the cloud? Your legacy applications are gonna require a certain amount of refactoring, which does lead to this magic question, how long will that take? There's only one answer I can give you that's accurate. It depends. Now, I can tell you from experience that if you do a few pilots, you're gonna get a feel for it. And you can start to get an understanding that, okay, for this factor, it takes us about this long to fix it. That won't be universal, and it doesn't transfer necessarily from one company to another. But within your portfolio, you can generally get a rough idea of how long it's gonna take to make that transition. In my experience, and you're gonna take it with a grain of salt, it was a few weeks per app, roughly. Not months, not days, measured in weeks. All right. Now, there are people who do this for a living, so don't be afraid to talk to them. I'm a big fan of having a lab-like thing where you have people that do this day in, day out. It's important that teams pair with these folks. It shouldn't just be a, here, I hand you the app, you hand it back to me running. We should be working together on this because we want to ultimately build these skills across our company. You want to create a roadmap so that we have a sense of when would you say our applications can move? And it's important to understand it doesn't always have to be the entire app. So one of the big challenges we faced in my previous company is from the senior VP level, the portfolio was 400 applications. When you start working with the teams, you realize that this one application to them is 15 modules. And then as you break that down into microservices, it's not 15 anymore, it's 45 or 100. But yet the VP still wants to think about it as one application. And so we had to actually kind of like invent a new term. We called them like deployable units, which was as good as we could come up with. We're not terribly creative. And so some are gonna be easier to move than others. That's okay, move what you can. Watch out for the terminology. Be opportunistic in what you migrate, opportunistic of what you refactor, but you want a rough idea of when you can make it move. That may or may not satisfy your stakeholders. 
you might have to bring in additional help to make it happen. I wish you luck. Well, folks, it is lunchtime. I'm going to shut up at this point. If you have comments or questions, I will be hanging around for the next couple hours. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Cheers.